Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. I'm Biola Lavi. And I'm Tundra Abiola. Our first guest, Dr. Abiodun Adeneye, is a diasporic and strategic communication scholar who teaches mass communication at Bayes University, Abuja. He went into academia after covering politics for Nigeria's The Guardian for more than a decade. He has also been a World Bank consultant and a visiting professor at the American University of Nigeria, AUN, Yola. He's now noted for his regular, dispassionate analysis of politics and public policy. Dr. Abiodun Adeneyi is in the Arise Studios Abuja, from where he has now joined us to look at the momentum of the major political parties as the campaigns hit the final stretch before the presidential election. Welcome to the program, Dr. Abiodun Adeneyi. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. So, having followed the campaigns and the presidential debates and interviews, what's your impression about the entire conversation around the forthcoming presidential election that is now less than two weeks away? Well, I think it's been so far so good. Um, we have had less reports of violence, less reports of crisis, and if you like, less tension as well. I think it, it just means that um, we are coming of age as a democracy. It just means that uh, we are ready to move to the next level, as in the proverbial next level, not necessarily the political one. I mean, we are moving to the next stage at the level of um, the evolution of our political uh, process, you know, and it makes a lot of sense to observe this because we are coming from a successful election in 2015 where a sitting president considered defeat. and. We are not hoping for anything less in this year's election. You know, um, we are seeing the build up already. We have two main candidates aside other uh, contenders. And the expectation is high that this election will also be very peaceful, okay? And at the end of, the, at, at the end of it all, we expect that the winner will be gratuitous in victory and will be gratuitous and be magnanimous in victory, and we expect the losers to as well uh, be gracious, you know, to as well uh, be very, very understanding in defeat. You know, we have made this point several times um, that politics should not necessarily be a do or die affair. If the mission, if the vision, and if the objective is essentially for service. And we have also made this point that um, it is not the only road to service, actually. There are stories, there are reports of outstanding individuals in world history who never went into partisan politics, but who were yet, who were yet able to impact on their society. You know, so if um, this is the case, then there's a sense in saying that we shouldn't be too, um, too we shouldn't be, we shouldn't see politics as a process where we must either win Okay, sometimes we can lose, you know, but it is gratifying to say that the build up to this election is um, fairly peaceful. You know, there might be political tensions around the corner, but hopes are high that we're going to build, we're going to consolidate of our, of our, on our gains from 2015, and from there we can proceed forward, we can move forward as a nation. Yes, please. Mm. Thank you. Um, based on just what you've said and yeah. some of the gains and some of the participants in, in this um, process, I guess the next question for you is when you take a look at the democratic process and the fact that we have, ha we have two major parties, but we've had quite a number of independents also as part of this political party. Who are the people that you feel have stood out when it comes to the third, sort of the third force that has um, been battled around? And then when you look at the two, part, two major parties, who do you believe has made their mark and probably, um, you would say, might be the one to um, walk away with the, with the final, final win on, uh, in 13 days? All right, um, very tricky one out there, you know, but Nigeria is essentially a multi-party democracy, you know, um, but even within this matrix, you know, we have come to identify two major political parties, uh, the PDP and the APC, that is, but it, it doesn't mean we should, that we should undermine the potentials or um, the possibility, the possibilities embedded in the other parties. What multi-party democracy envisages is, is a broadening political space 
where participation will not be limited to any group or any interest group, you know, so to say. So it is good that we are operating this system. It means that we have spaces for everybody. We have spaces and places for everybody to operate, for every ideological um, leaning to uh, be involved. You know, it's about inclusion. It's about participation. And it's about um, increasing our sense of involvement. You know, that's the essence of multipartism anywhere in the world. Um, and especially drawing from the United States of America, where we often ape and idolize. You know, but the fact that we have two so-called behemoths does not mean, like I said earlier, that we should undermine um, other forces. They are very critical. In India and Canada, for instance, there are smaller parties that are able to win elections and are able to co-function, to cohabit, you know, to partner with central main governments, you know, cent parties that control the center. We can also, you know, replicate um, this kind of um, um, or a system, you know, whereby we don't think, we don't privilege, we don't prioritize just two main parties, you know. But I uh, agree that these things can, should always be organic. You know, it, it should always come as a natural process. We'll probably get there at the right time, possibly. But for me to um, place a hand on who is likely to win the election, or who I think is going to have an edge over the other. Well, I can only rely, rely on exit polls, you know. Um, but even if I'm going to rely on exit polls for now, it is also going to be problematic, you know, to be um, mathematical about it. You know, we cannot be definite about it because politics can be very fluid and voters can also be very shifty. They can also be very unpredictable in, in the way and manner they make uh, decisions. And let's not forget that exit polls has its major limitation because there are still some undecided voters, even as we speak, um, even two weeks to the election. You know. So the thing to say is just to, um, is just to keep our fingers crossed and emphasize um, the fact that we need peace, most importantly, okay, over who win or who loses. Mm. Looking sort of broadly at the different messages being passed on by the parties, <coughs> which ones, in your estimation, have taken root with the electorate? You have the ruling party, the APC, talking about their next level agenda, but referring to 16 years of what they view as PDP misrule and attributing blame for a lot of the you know, shortcomings that we witness now. And you have the PDP with their plan to get Nigeria working again and blaming APC's mismanagement or what they view as mismanagement on our current situation rather than taking the blame, as it were, for a lot of the problems that we have. And then the third force who sort of discredit both major parties and try to present themselves as a viable alternative. How do you feel that the electorate has received these messages and which ones resonate the most? Well, um, again, um, your question is also very tricky because you're asking me to come to judgment, to sit in judgment over the programs of the parties. Uh, but there's something that we, we should find very gratifying from all the um, ideological positioning, you know, all the um, articulated programs of the parties. You know, this is about the first time in the history of um, uh, uh, political parties' participation in politics that we are seeing a conscious attempt by groups, you know, to build a body of ideas, to build a body of programs around which they want to bring about development, should they win um, the election. And I've said this several times that I've heard about Spencer Heath, I've heard about Swift, I've heard about um, the one you mentioned, next level, I've heard about let's get Nigeria working again, and I've heard about um, the one by the People's Trust, being our life for Hashim, and many other ones like that, you know. Um, this speaks to the fact that our system is good. Some of them have even gone ahead, like uh, Kinsley Mogalu and Tokwe Fashua, to even write books, to produce books around we, um, where they embody, where they come up with ideas on what they want to do. This is good for us. This is um, trying to intellectualize the process, and it makes a meaning at the level of, um, you know, uh, prioritizing ideology. You know, maybe with time, we we'll begin to move away from seeing the political parties as just vehicles for um, for get, getting official positions, but as, and again, as um, something that would take us to 
um, the level of development that we want to be to be, that we want to be at. Okay, but to say really um, with some sense of statistical exactitude as to which one is better and which or which one is um, not good can actually be um, a challenge because you must give it to all of them that somehow they have sections of the populace that their own programs, that their own ideologies resonate with. And it's only after the election that we can actually know. Because like I said earlier, politics is very fluid. You know, decision making um, is very shifty. You know, and the only time you can even you can see this manifest is um, during the electionary period. Okay, but again, it is gratifying that we we'll see the evolution of um, the process of um, ideation. You know, evolution of the process of bringing about ideologies through programs in, amongst our political parties. This is gratifying. I think um, it is it is um, nice for now for us to celebrate that and maybe. Um, from my own point of view, um, try, uh, not try to privilege one over the other. Because in doing so, we might be unfair, especially if at the end of the day, through the ballot boxes, through the votes, uh, we are proving to be wrong. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for that. And a follow-up to just sort of um, what um, Tundun said. You, you had mentioned ideal ideology, especially in a multi-party system. And a lot of the things that we've been saying have been a lot of the slogans and some of the things from the manifesto. But when you look at the language of this campaign and the fact that we still have not been able to have all the candidates on a stage at the same time, this has made it very difficult to make this campaign really about issues and about a debate between the candidates. What do you say about that when it comes to this multi-party system and the, and the health of our democracy, the fact that we still haven't had all the candidates on one stage actually debating the issues? Very well. That's actually still very regrettable, you know, because debates is an exchange. It's just an invitation for you to come and say yourself, for you to project your ideas, for you to tell the populace, you know, um, what you want to do should you get into power. You know, it's a process of refining uh, your ideas, your program. You know, sometimes when you bounce it off people by telling them, they raise questions around some subject matters, and by the time they do that, you're able to refine, um, review, and reevaluate some of your positions. So at the end of the day, if you probably win, then you have a watertight position, okay? Uh, but the tragedy of the situation is that some of our leaders, some of our elders, some of our politicians are yet to come to terms um, with these facts. You know, they are yet to come to terms with this advantage of, um, of that is embedded in debating. You know, but again, um, you can look at it from the fact that um, we are democracy is still underdeveloped. Don't forget, we're just 20 years in, an, in, in uh, operating an uninterrupted um, democracy. Um, yes, it is important to debate. Yes, it is important for all the aspirants, all the key aspirants to come together to be on one stage, you know. Um, but we have also have to understand that um, some of the aspirants regrettably also have um, limitations in terms of capacity. They may not want to tell us this, but we know so, you know, and um, we just hope that at some point we'll perfect it and move to a level where even our debating system will become very sophisticated as well. In fact, what we are doing now is asking them to just come and uh, debate on a, on a one-off basis. But in the United States, for instance, you find out that, you know, uh, when, ahead, ahead of the presidential election, there are three sets of debates, the first, the second, and the third. And the electorate often want to know the aspirants from the first um, debates. For instance, look at the, the Trump-Clinton debates in um, 2016 or so. 84 million viewers were recorded on television, okay? Although it declined with the second and the third debate. But what it means is that the, the electorate use the first debate to gauge, to improve their understanding of the candidates. You know, to make up their mind, probably. And once they did that, um, they, they just felt the second and the third ones were no longer um, important, even though the debates are usually in sections according to issues. You know, yes, we are not at this level yet. You know, we hope to get there. Okay, um, and it is also important, you know, um, to end this uh, argument that we need to come to a stage where the debating will be made a compulsory item an item that is obligatory on the electoral calendar. 
so that candidates will not feel that it is something they can dodge mm. or it is something they can avoid. You know, it is important for them to engage the populace. It is important for them to let us know what their mission, what their vision, what their objectives are. And it's important for them, for us to also know that these ones who are asking us for their votes are actually competent, you know, to, um, to lead us. And it will help us in the process of choice making and democracy is about choice. And it's true choice, it's, it's, a, it's another form of competition anyway. And true choice, you're able to make the best, you're able to, um, get, we're able to give ourselves the best mm -hmm. and propel ourselves to um, the, the ideal level of development that we want to be in. Yep. Mm. Just a follow-up question to that. I mean, you made a reference to the Trump-Clinton debate. Um, you also, um, I also just want to bring your attention to the one of the, um, Obama's first debates during his second term, in which he actually did woeful in that debate, yeah. but came back and actually won the election. So when you say that some of the candidates are not, they don't have, they have limited capacity, is that an excuse or a reason for people not to debate? Because what people can do is actually with continued debate, they get better. And then they also, and then the, the citizen, especially people that are going to go and cast their ballots, get to know them better. Anyone with limited capacity, should they really be running for a president in Nigeria? Ah, yeah, very um, intelligent question, no doubt. You know, but we need to also understand that uh, uh, politics is what it is. You know, uh, politics is not sometimes based on merit. It's not sometimes based on professionalism. It, it's just based on desire. You know, on what you think you can do. You know, on the kind of spirit, the kind of determination, the kind of guts that you have. You know, as a human being. And in so far as you can meet some of the basic requirements, some of the basic constitutional provisions, you know, some of the basic legal requirements, you are welcome to be on the stage. You are welcome to be on the soapbox. That's what politics is, really. You know, and it's not like you, are, you want to go and apply for a bank job, or you want to go and apply for um, a professorial position, you know, or you want to be, um, you want to work in a medical facility. You know, so politics is like. Um, something that welcomes everybody, you know, as long as you meet some of the basic constitutional requirements. You know, so um, to that extent, um, you may not want to uh, categorically exclude some categories of people, even if they are obviously incompetent, even if they are, are actually obviously lack the um, intellectual capacity. But if systems grow, societies grow up to a point where these ones are automatically, where these ones are organically shifted of the space, I mean, moved of the space, for instance. In, in, in a sophisticated democracy like the US, the UK, uh, like Canada that we've been talking about, it is very almost impossible for you to see somebody who doesn't have capacity um, to present himself for leadership because the system will, will sieve this person away. The system will eliminate um, um, these people, you know, any, those kind of people away. Nigeria is a fledging democracy, like I've said, with just 20 years in terms of consistent practice of it. You know, we hope that at some point, you know, certain things will come up, you know, um, that will help us see this incompetent, this incapable people away from the space, away from our, our political space. You know, but for now that our laws are still permissive, there's hardly anything we can do. And do not forget as well that the level of participation we are having in politics is a reflection of the kind of society we are in. Um, in, the, uh, in the sphere of education, where we are still very li limited, where we still have high level of illiteracy, it's also a reflection of the economy, the kind of economy we have, you know, where, where, where uh, poverty is, is still very prevalent, and the kind of the health sector, all the sectors of, our de of sectors of development, we are still operating at a below average level. Mm. You know. So by the time we get to some stage, uh, we we'll hope that uh, uh, we will be able to uh, um, view ourselves with pride, uh, you know, through um, ensuring that it is only capable and competent people um, that uh, present themselves for leadership. Yep. Now, this week's um, massacre of close to 70 people in Rand, Borno State, is a tragic reminder that terrorism is still very much on the front burner as an issue in this country. How do you think that this will affect President Muhammadu Buhari's chances at the election, bearing in mind that he got a lot of support in 2015, because of his military background, he rose to the level of general. How has he borne up under the weight of those expectations? Oh, well, 
now we're getting to the specific show to say, um, you know, insurgency, terrorism is a very um, difficult thing to track. You know, it's um, a major problem, and it is important to also say that uh, many nations are still, many nations are still grappling with it, and even the most developed militaries in the world, you know, are still unable to deal with it in sections of the world where they are intervening. Uh, but that's not to say that there cannot be a solution. That's not to say that leaders should not, um, you know, be up and doing in, in trying to deal with it. And it is not to give um, excuse, it's not to explain away um, the fact that we've not been able to deal with it nine, ten years after um, it, it reared its head. You know, um, very largely, I would say, without being specific, that from the period of Jonathan up to the period of Buhari, when this thing has fledged, uh, and the fact that we've not been able to deal with it all through these two administration is very largely a failure of leadership, no doubt. You know, but if we're saying leadership, it means not just lead, uh, political leadership, it also involves military leadership. It also involves um, public service leadership. It also involves civil service leadership. Because Nigeria is not too complex for us not to be able to route, you know, um, an insurgency that is cocooned into a small section of the country like the Northeast, you know. And don't, don't forget that it's not the whole of the Northeast, but just a section of the Northeast, really. And it's a shame that we've not been able to deal with this nine to ten years after, you know, and um, we just have to continue to hope that at the appropriate time, our leaders, and like I said, not just political leaders, military leaders, you know, um, public service leaders, civil service leaders, you know, we, we, we do the proverbial right thing, you know, to ensure that we live in peace as a people. Um, yes, the military, you know, have tried thus far. Um, they have record substantial losses, you know. Um, they are putting their best at different levels, but perhaps at the level of leadership, um, still more still has to be done, you know. And it is a hope their sacrifices will not be in vain in trying to preserve, in trying to ensure that the rest of us are able to sleep, you know. But it's also a call to action, you know, that um, there's still more to be done. You know, our leaders should rise to their responsibility, you know, and we cannot continuous, continuously be kept um, in fear. You know, no nation develops amidst strife, amidst insurgency. You know, it's a major problem to economic development. We need to deal with this as soon as possible. Hmm. Um, when, I mean, when people go to the um, polling booth um, in 13 days, we've obviously we talked about um, the, the attacks in Borno, the increasing threats of Boko Haram um, across the country. ISIS West Africa has now become part of the conversation we, we're having. There was also some peripheral threats around the Niger Delta. Um, in, insurgency as well um, during this administration's um, um, during this administration's for someone that really came on the back of security and this was still one of the major major points do you think that Nigerians are going to task this administration when it comes to when it comes to the the, the polling booths in 13 days but also one of the criticism of this administration has been a lack of empathy during attacks and a lack of communication during attacks and I think people have been doing comparisons between this this administration and this president and Kenyan's um, administration and um, Uhuru Kenyatta's response to repeated threats it's not that other places are not getting these type of attacks or threats. It's the response and the communication. What do you say and how do you think Nigerians are going to react at the polls when it comes to this part of this administration's um, record? Well, there's no doubt that, you know, we are still not at the level at which we want to be in terms of how government responds to um, threats to security. There's no doubt about it, you know, and um, um, some of these things are actually dependent on the kind of person you have, you have in positions of authority, the kind of persons you have in position of authority. What kind of person are they? You know, how dynamic, how suave, you know, how creative can they be in, in, in the face of uh, crisis, in the case of attacks, in the face of attacks? You know, but we also need to know that 
um, in the situation where you have attacks on a daily basis, really, you know, where you keep up having attack almost on a daily basis in different sections of the country, you know, it's going to be a greater shame for a leader that, uh, that values his reputation to begin to come out on an everyday basis to sympathize with people over um, the one kind of attack or the other. You know, if it becomes an everyday affair, then it becomes very ironically ridiculous. You know, I would rather that they just they sit back, you know, and find long-term solutions um, to this problem. I would rather that they do that um, instead of um, coming to repeat, repeating the same thing to us on an everyday basis. And you know, this, thing, this is not peculiar to one administration, really. Yes, uh, President Buhari has, has his feelings, and they're very obvious. You know, and if he wins, we hope that they'll, they'll find ways of improving the no problem. Ways, you know, but we've also had past, administ past administrations in this country that also have their failings, you know, and it's a whole range of inadequacies on their part, really, you know, but, and it speaks to the fact that, you know, we're yet to evolve as a nation at the level of nationalism, at the level of patriotism, at the level of having a body of, um, a holistic body of ideology that we can subscribe to. You know, nationhood, you know, is yet to evolve in us. You know, that's why a lot of people will tell you that we're just a nation state yet. We don't na we, nationhood is yet to evolve in us. By the time we have this, you know, they will have to, we will not have um, an organized set of leaders subscribing um, to this nationness, subscribing to this national ideology, which is the protection of, um, that which is a making step, you know, to, to bring about peace, happiness, and prosperity, you know, which is first and foremost the reason why um, nations exist. But we are, we are yet to be at this level, which is why um, we we'll continue to blame our leaders for our failings, for our inadequacies, you know. But for us to say whether it will affect um, one administration or the other, or maybe this administration at the election, well, again, I will say that it's still something we may, we may find problematic, uh, placing a definite hand on, you know. Um, it will be decided at the polls, and it will be interesting to see um, what it comes out to be. Yeah. Wow. Dr. Abiodun it's always a pleasure to have you on. We look forward to having you back as we wind, um, as we get closer and closer to Decision Day 2019. And um, we hope that our next conversation will be able to talk more about the polls and um, predictions. And we look forward to having you back. Once again, thank you for being here. It's time now for a short break. When we return, Arise News analyst and producer Charles Owaku will be joining us to review the top newspaper headlines from across the country. Stay with us. <laughs>